Mate, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. I think, um, like I said to you over the phone, uh, I wanted to get you on the show ever since I read your book, which I have right here, Addicted. I've got to read your other one too. Um, have you written two? Yes. Yeah, we, we, so Kieran and I wrote that one and it was a follow-up to the first one that we wrote. Um, it has my name on the front, but it was very much a team effort. I, I wrote kind of half of it and then the other half was, was, uh, was Kieran, Mark, uh, my wife, Naomi, um, and another health professional works for this Tony Carmody. So we wrote the first book, which was breaking the ice and mm. two very different kinds of books. Um, the first book was, it almost, it's like, it almost feels like it's a bunch of short stories. So quite different to addicted, but I love stories, which is why obviously addicted is very kind of story driven as well. So yeah, but two very different types of books. Just, just quickly, what was the synopsis of Breaking the Ice? Breaking the Ice was really a response to Australia's response to ice, which was, yeah. you know, in the view of a lot of people, um, you know, people were getting really scared. You remember that every headline was, was ice this and ice that. Mm. And, you know, someone, you know, zombie, ice zombie chews her own toes off um was was one headline um you know the tv ads that the government had out there of, of of someone's you know picking up a chair and smashing it through the window and it was just it was frankly hysteria and yeah. and for an organization at the front line working with more kids um than most um who, who were actually you know coming off ice and dealing with an ice addiction it was disturbing for us because it wasn't portraying reality. We were working with these kids and, and as most people know, someone who's, who's suffering from an ice psychosis is, is, is really more often than not coming off ice. And so we were dealing with that. We weren't, you know, we were dealing with those kids who were coming off ice and they, they're not, they weren't throwing chairs through windows. Uh, they weren't chewing their own toes off. Um, <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the sad reality was, was that of course that happens for, for a, a a, a small number of people um, with 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 comorbid conditions, but the but the truth was was that was that ice was exacerbating a lot of pre-existing um, you know conditions for people. That was the that was the truth that needed to be told, and we did and and to demonise people to call them zombies, and that's what was happening. The 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 the, the advertising around entertainment at the time was. Um, Shows like Breaking Bad was really popular at the time, and so was that zombie show. What's that? Zo- that that was a big zombie show at the time. Yeah. Uh, Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Walking yep. Dead. And and you know and so our media was either consciously or or, or unconsciously, um, you know, you know, portraying these portraying what was happening in real life. Um, as a reflection of what was happening as, as entertainment. And for me, that's disturbing. It's disturbing for a number of different reasons, um, obviously, because it, it wasn't the truth. But it also, I believe, was exacerbating the, the issue and wasn't allowing us to help people. It, it's harder. We, we're, we're, when we're scared of someone, we, genera- we, we generally find it harder to help them. Um, and, and so we needed to. Um, just stop, pause, uh, reflect on what was going on, understand the facts, and 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 then take a scientific approach. And so that book was us kind of throwing down the gauntlet, saying, "Actually, government, you've got this wrong. You need to take a different approach." And and, um, and thankfully, Malcolm Turnbull um, became prime minister at the time. And one of his first things was um, he called us into the room. We started working together on this, and and he. He had uh, Tony, under Tony Abbott the um, there was a thing called the Ice Task Force, mm. a really wonderful ex police commissioner, Victorian police commissioner Ken Lay, ran that task force, and I'm not sure what Tony Abbott was looking from that um, from that particular task force, but but Ken Lay and his team came back and said the national response actually needs to not be law enforcement led when it comes to ice; it needs to be treatment led. And a lot of it's about about um, how we how we work with people, both with addiction and other um, you know 
so comorbid issues and mental health Mm. and and poverty and so on. And Malcolm Turnbull listened to him and we had a, we had a really fantastic um, national response. Now, unfortunately that, that, you know, that uh, response has kind of been winding down a bit now because obviously other things are, are, are at play, but what was happening at the time, bizarrely, and this is what we wrote about in the book was, Ice issues were were um, were always were actually already on their way down. So ice use was on its way down, um, and people, you know, I'd go and do talks about this, and the book was an attempt to 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 have more space to talk about these issues. You and I, in a in a podcast over the next hour, can can kind of really get into some juicy detail. But when I'm doing five minutes, oh God, five minutes on TV would be huge. It's actually more like 30 second, 30 second soundbite, get yeah. across the, the issue. And um, the book was in a, in a, you know, really an attempt to say, actually, here's, here are the facts. This is what we need to understand. And this is, this is our way forward. And that's what it was. Breaking the ice was, 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 was how, how we'll get through the, through the ice crisis. And I think largely we have a lot of those kind of, predictions came true we you know, ice continued to fall now covid's going to kind of throw a spanner in the works we're going to have a really interesting time i think over the next couple of years with with drug use and stuff which which mm-hmm. we can get into later in the show but but that's what that book was about was was a response to that and a way of taking time to really go through all of those different those different facts yes ice is absolutely a problem um but let's get this into perspective uh, and, and please let's not demonize anyone. We're never going to help out them or, or ourselves by doing so. Yeah. I think that's such a, such a necessary piece to write. And you can, you can actually see how some of those ideas came into this book, you know, just let's actually remove the surface level and at least ask the question why these people find these drugs so enticing, you know? Mm. Well, I think that's a really good question, you know, and I, I remember at a very young age in my teens, I started reading my grandfather's books and he was starting to, he was attempting to, to answer those questions. Why does someone use drugs in the first place? And, you know, all we had back in the sixties and seventies when, when, when heroin was really taking off around the world um, was that it taking off in a, in a problematic way. And this is basically because there were, you know, stricter, you know, prohibitions around it. And, and Nixon really cracked down on, on, you know, we often think about kind of the war on drugs as the big kind of marketing campaign um, against drugs, but really um, they were in the U S looking at both uh, cannabis and, and heroin. And a lot of the returned vets were, were addicted to, to drugs like heroin. So they were, their their response was they were you know Pete used to even in Australia you used to be able to go to the pharmacy and get heroin over the counter my um you know our, our grandmothers were given you know a, a basically a a form of heroin to have to have children to have babies that was the that was the the the, the drug um the good and, old days <laughs> um the good old days you know and and you know and there was a you know that so so we kind of moved from a place where heroin was very much a, a a pharmaceutical to to a um to a place where it where it became a, a you know a very dangerous substance and when one that needed to be incredibly prohibited ac- across the board and that created all sorts of problems in itself not you know so so Ted, my grandfather attempted to understand what he called watching a horror movie in slow motion in the sixties and seventies and eighties with heroin. And it came in to Australia through not many people know this, but it was really, it flooded in through the, the, uh, the sailors, uh, the U S the U S Marines would, would come in uh, through Woolloomooloo and they'd bring in the, the, the heroin there and, and it would get it flooded in through, through King's cross. So that's why King's mm. cross kind of became, you know, it still is one of the epicenters of heroin. Obviously we've got Victoria and um, yeah. places around Melbourne mm-hmm. and Richmond and so on. So, but that was the beginning. So, so Ted's response to that was why are people doing this? Why, why are we doing this? And he tried to look for a few different reasons of why people were not, not so much addicted. They weren't really looking at addiction through that, but just using drugs. 
And of course, you know, we, we've got a different view now, but Ted was looking at all sorts of things. And he, he, I remember he wrote a piece in, in one of his books about that, that, that desire for flight that we, we want to, we want to achieve greater things. It was a lovely idea. I think that there's probably, there's an element of truth there. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't simplify it in that way now, but he said that, you know, we, 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 do, we desire that. I think, I think it's now we can, we can look back and say, why do we use drugs? And the answer is, is we're human, <laughs> exactly. you know, um, you know yeah. we're, we're human and, 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 and he was separating drugs like, like heroin from, from tea. Um, and, and that's the first place I get to in breaking the ice was actually like my, my real true addiction is, is, is a, is a cup of tea. It's not, it's not true. And as my, as my, my understanding of addiction forms, it's actually my whole, my whole life. It's my yeah. work. It's my, yeah. it's my love. It's, it's, and it is a cup of tea. Um, and, um, and, and so on all the way to, to alcohol and, and so forth. And, and, and probably my least favorite at the moment, which I'm really, as I was just saying to you before we got on here, try, trying to get away from my phone, mm. I just deleted, I just deleted my Gmail app from my, from my oh, phone, which is why I had to get you to, yeah, which I had to get you to, to send that link via, via messaging because, sure. because, because I needed one of these kind of um, silly looking things to, to help with my <laughs> neck because I'm, I'm starting to do this, you know, oh, yeah. and, and heaps and, and, and it's really giving me headaches. And so I needed to kind of, you know, something to remind me to keep my posture up, but, but it also it reflected something greater, which was that I'm spending a lot of time in my phone. I'm spending a lot of time on, on, you know, things that I tell myself are really important, you know, the population of a, of a country, a, an actor who, <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who you know who's that how, how old is the the one i googled the other day which was hilarious and really yeah. really identifies just how how bad my addiction got was was how old is russell howard the comedian and because I, I was like oh. I, I said to my wife i bet he's my age and guess what he is he's 40 <laughs> um go. and now now my life is now my life is so much better no it's yes not. that's it's, right <laughs> it's a these are this isn't this is an addiction and, and this is and so so is my use of the iPhone, um, my desire for flight. No, it's not my desire for flight. It's it's actually it's actually all sorts of things. And so in in its positive form, it is it is a a desire for 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 wisdom, and for knowledge, and 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 understanding mm. new ideas and and other things. But in its worst form, it's an attempt to escape myself. It's an attempt to look away from. As Alan de Botton, I think, really nails his parties. It's an attempt to hurt myself, um, and um, and whether I know it or not, because I'm walking away from self knowledge. So I think that there's, mm. I think there's, mm. you know, use is use is is interesting. Use is is really interesting, and and it is, you know, it is human uh, using using all forms of substances and objects is incredibly human and, um, and, and it'll always be the case. Addiction, something completely different. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, there are so many good points in that. I think um, something that perhaps um, Ted might've been missing out on, on, on when he was doing this work was just the crazy amount of work that's been done in neuroscience, in the trauma field and having a look at how those kinds of experiences shape the brain. Um, you know, you mentioned something before, like when we're in a fear state, it's harder for us to be rational and think long-term and all those wonderful things as well. But I, I'm, I'm probably more um, in your corner with the fact that, you know, uh, the, the need to remove ourselves from a state of pain into a state of pleasure is just inherent within the human biology in the human psyche and um mm. i mean there's no question why given that biology um most spiritual practices try to willingly confront the pain side of things so asceticism yeah. and all that sort of stuff you know yeah well then no that's it that's it and and um uh, you you really nailed that point um that's what that's what we miss when we when we wake up or, or are born as atheists and say that there is no God that I think that's, you know, for me that, that really worked um, into some level to, to help my life. Mm. And the thing that it, the thing that it, that it 
doesn't confront is the idea that I still have spiritual needs as an atheist. And, and I, that's what I really find that, that, that atheists like Richard Dawkins and stuff really kind of gloss over is that we still have spiritual needs, you know, and, and you just now the point, one of the greatest spiritual needs is to identify um, my suffering and to, to help me alleviate that. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, and so, you know, the other day, and we'll get into it, would be like looking at what Van der Kirk says and what we do in our street universities, physicality, moving through my pain, moving past my trauma, literally moving, going for a jog, jumping on the trampoline with the kids, going for a surf, um, playing the drums like I have here. I'm a terrible, yeah, terrible drummer. That's a, that's a hundred dollar, a hundred dollar drum kit from Aldi. Thanks, Aldi. Perfect. Um, <laughs> They're actually sponsors of the show. Um, so I appreciate that, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, but you know, um, there's a, there's a, so physicality is really important, but what about, what about other, other, other forms? And, and so for me and our team at, at, at NOFS, we meditate together every morning. Mm. The exec team meditates before we do anything else, before we get into work, before we do anything else, the exec team sits down and meditates on Zoom together um, every every single morning, Monday to Friday. Um, and um, one of us might, might drop out of a day or whatever and do that. And we um, we 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 also use different forms of meditation. The most consistent form of meditation is is, is transcendental meditation, which we learned through the transcendental meditation. Uh, uh, organization in in Australia, and we were first sponsored to do that by the David Lynch Foundation in the US, mm-hmm. which is great. Um, and he's a I love David Lynch; he's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So that that we 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 do that together, and that's not that's not for everyone. Meditation is something that I've been doing, you know, since I was in my early twenties, and that comes from the other side of my family, not not Ted. Um, and my nan Margaret, but my other, my other son, my other grandmother, um, loved meditating and left behind all these meditating books when she passed away. And I picked mm. them up in my early twenties and began meditating then. And it was that that quest for for self knowledge and the 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 digging deep and and going down and kind of figuring out what was happening inside. And that's continued to be really really important in in my life. Um, and, uh, and I think that meditation, meditation is a way that, uh, uh, it is in some form of spiritual practice, but, it, but not, I'm not talking about it in an esoteric sense. And for some mm-hmm. people it is, mm-hmm. but actually from that, exactly what you just said, which is a, a point of self-discovery. It's the opposite of me in my in me and my iPhone and me escaping the, this self-knowledge, it's actually going and going, why did I feel hurt um, when he said that? And, 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 and then understanding those things. And so in, in, a, in a sense, um, one of, one of uh, my colleagues the other day during meditation said that he'd spent the whole meditation in a meeting with himself yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you know, <laughs> going through things and checklists and stuff like that. And sometimes it is that. And and I think that it's almost like it's almost sometimes a therapy session with yourself and 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 it can be it can take on all forms. So so yeah, I think you nailed it when you when you when you when you mentioned that about those sorts of practices. Yeah, well it's you know, I'm I'm very similar with you again. Like I I just feel like we've lost um that practical element to what religion was all about. You know, I grew up in a time, um, I'm, I'm 27 now, so grew up in a time, have a listen to me. Um, but, you know, I was raised a, a Catholic and all this sort of stuff. And we were given the very kind of supernatural idea of God and religion, you know, the kind of aspect of God and religion that people like Dawkins debate, which in my opinion is, you know, a 12 year old, debate that sort of thing i i love the work him and hitchens did and they, they really helped me but i think when we're like 10 and 12 years old we start thinking like um you know is god real in the same time we start thinking about whether or not the tooth fairy is real so they're good yeah. questions to have but that that throwing out the baby bit with the bathwater has i i'm i'm sure i'm not only speaking for myself 
when I say that it's left us with this, um, you know, confusion around how to um, self transcend, you know, um, mm. and then we get so addicted to these things because it's kind of like, well, what else is there to do? Like, why, why should I go and practice being bored? Like what's the purpose mm. around yes. that sort of stuff? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, yes. And I think that's it. That, that's a really good, question i was talking to my daughters about it this morning um and they're you know um eight and ten and and that boredom conversation came up and i talked about it in through the lens of that idea of of phones and that that you know with less um digital interference we we do find ourselves more bored and 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 i was talking of course very much like a boring dorkish dad <laughs> saying yes um you know um these digital devices really do you know um satiate that that part of ourselves which says i'm bored and i want to do something else but 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 you know and i was saying you know we th these these times of boredom is when you know obviously our brains grow and I, and they're looking at me like oh, you know come on you know, what if it's we, we ended up, we ended up getting into to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. True. Oh, wow. And, um, and they, um, and, uh, and they were, they're like, they're just like, shut up. Yeah. Um, so, so <laughs> do TikTok. It, it, yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's a, but there's a, there's something that there's a conversation with our kids here, obviously, I'm joking when I'm talking about eight and 10, but these years leading into, into adolescence are really important to have this conversation mm. and you wouldn't frame it in the way I just did about like, you know, yes, boredom is really important and so on w where we're at. And I think this is a really important thing for you to, to think about too, in terms of writing and ideas, yeah. the next part of our discovery and our journey of discovery is to learn how to communicate to young people um, um, that boredom is important, why it's important and ways that they can um, use it without suffering. Because if boredom was yeah. something which um, was fun, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have that feeling. And when I say boredom, you know what the feeling is. And it's like, oh, so if it was fun, we wouldn't feel that way. However, let's just come back down one level from that kind of somatic um, response and just say, um, what, if, what if it was neutral? Um, okay, that's actually a step forward. But, but our sense of boredom right now is, especially because of our digital devices, yep. boredom, com boredom comes with a, a certain sense of suffering. And if kids were able to say, okay, um, one, this is important to me, but two, um, there's a way I can feel neutral about this. I think it's going to help. So, so we're on this path of discovery together. And there are things that we learned probably back in the eighties, you know, with, um, you know, dear friend of mine, Philip Adams did the life be in it campaigns with, with Norm. And, um, I think it was, was his wife, Jean, I um, can't remember on, on those, uh, you, you were, um, not born, no. um, but um, <laughs> I don't. But, I didn't even but, know if I was an but, idea yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You were a concept. Of I was a concept. Future. You're you're a vision, and <laughs> um, right. and and and. But back then, there was there was when I was a little kid, there was this, there were these TV ads, and it was life be in it. And it was a cartoon, and really the 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 attempt was to get Australians to take care of their of their health. And you know what? Look back and look where we got to, and where the US got to. And to some degree, it worked. Um, mm. We started becoming more conscious of of what we're eating and our health and exercise. And so, so there are ways that we can help the next generation understand uh, boredom and mm. and devices. And you know, um, how deeply do we get into this notion of self knowledge? Well, we might not. I think that our our task now is to um, is to is to find other words and ways of communicating it. So it doesn't yeah. sound like how I'm saying it to you here. So it doesn't sound academic. So it sounds like, oh yeah, I get it, and I want to pursue that. 
Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, you know, something I was just thinking of as well, because one thing that I think you did a brilliant job of in this book was outline the very fact that, you know, addiction is a spectrum. It's not just a binary, yes, I'm addicted, no, I'm not. It's like, well, to the degree, you know, and, and, it, and it can only be that way when you look at how we've evolved in, in responding to um, basically just external positive emotion, you know? Um, and um, we speaking about, you know, trying to get children and adolescents into this, trying to understand um, the differences between suffering, living healthy lifestyle and all that sort of stuff. Because it is such a spectrum, it's such a challenging place we find ourselves. I'm certainly looking forward to this when I become a dad, looking forward to this mm. in quote, quoted marks, you know, but mm. you know, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, um, what was pleasurable was just having dinner on the table, you know, and now the spectrum has shifted so much because we've become so materialistic, which is a good thing fundamentally because we're, you know, growing um, and society, but suffering is now not eating ice cream every night, you know, it's eating ice cream once. It, so the spectrum has shifted. So I think um, trying to, it's almost, we have to go the other way now as a society and, and, and try to entertain the, not, I suppose you're totally right, man. Like what's the right word here? It's not suffering, but like the, maybe the why, like, you know, if you do this, what the reason to do this? I don't know. Yeah. So, it, so it's marketing. Yeah. Um, and, and that you, you're right to, a, to, a, to an extent where um, we have become not only so materialistic, but we've dumbed ourselves down where, mm. where you and I, enjoy reading things True. but we know that a, that a majority of people aren't going to read my book um i'm surprised how many people have read <laughs> um that that's book. a good book um <laughs> i tell everyone I about it actually just by the way so <laughs> that's very that's very kind of you but the reality is is most people won't read it and and if i really wanted to get those ideas out there then i'd be making youtube videos and I'd be making really short YouTube videos and, 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 and I'd be making sure that they were um, watched regularly. So, so what does that say about us? Exactly what you just said. We've become more materialistic, but we're actually time is happening a lot faster for us. And we all sense that. And COVID, COVID has mucked around with our sense of time. We are already traveling very fast and our sense of time was really sped up. And what, why is time sped up? Well, it's the opposite. When we meditate, that part of our brain that, that, that understands or is aware of time slows down. And so we're able, in a sense, we feel like we're able to do more things and we're able to, to have more control or a sense of control. Mm-hmm. And we're able to, to manage a lot more ideas. Um, we're able to have children and work and do that and, and seek a sense of self at the same time as, as you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, mm, suggests yeah. that once we're, once we've dealt with putting food on the table for ourselves and the kids, we can kind of ponder these other parts. Meditation does that, but phones, and I'm being very simplistic because that's what you and I and the viewers need right now. Yep. The opposite of that is the phone. And those forms of addiction, which call, which call us away from the present moment and which call us to, um, to turn away from those things that require our attention. And this is the notion of hurt. This is when it begins to hurt ourselves because we, we aren't paying attention to our deeper psychological needs. We aren't paying attention to the two things like the, the, the traumas and so on that might have happened during the day and all the way back in the past to our childhoods. And we're we're turning away from that in the same way when we when we when we turn to to drugs for this for the same reason. So so we so so like time's going a lot faster and the phone is doing the phone is doing that and the phone and I think the the that the iPhone I love you know I love Apple um so much and and you know I think they're a really wonderful company and I think there are companies that are far far worse than than they are but i think that because of the iphone we're also um we're actually 
spending less time in the present and therefore less time with ourselves and, 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 and we're hurting ourselves because of it. So we need to find a balance. And I think that a clever life be in it campaign by someone like a Philip Adams who did the original ones, you know, something of the future would, would be, you know, around that idea of taking a break from your phone. I think we'll see those ads in the next 10 years. And I think COVID, I think COVID will have inspired it too because we're, we're, we're time is like, so time isn't just faster now because of COVID. Um, you know, COVID actually has kind of slowed it down, sped it up, slowed it down because it depends yeah. what the news says. It depends what's happening in Victoria. And, our, and going back to what you said, our sense of fear and our anxiousness actually can speed up and slow down time as well. So, so time's a bit more wobbly, I'd say, with, with COVID. But let's come back to your point. How do we get these really important messages across for people? How do we educate ourselves and others? And, and I think books are, are important because they give us enough time in a long format to express ideas that where formats like we're in now don't really allow us to, to, to get in there. I mean, a format like this where we can talk for an hour is fantastic. But the reality is, is that whilst, you know, most people won't read my book, um, a lot of people won't watch this while a lot of people will, but most people will watch like a, if you did a, um, a five minute grab of this interview and with the best parts as an ad, for instance, most people will watch that. And if you're able to, in that five minutes, simplify those messages into bite-sized chunks, them and, and repeat that and repeat that and repeat that that's something that people will carry forward so so our savior you know salvation i should say in the future um in terms of self-knowledge does weirdly tie in with what you're saying with materialism i think that we can't turn away from so I, I don't you know i don't really appreciate social media but it is there and i would be an idiot to say we're just going to kind of look away from it in the same way that we thought that the internet might have been a fad in the nineties and it really was yeah. questionable whether the internet was a fad or not. The, these things are a part of our life. iPhones are a part of our life. Um, and I would be fundamentalist and prohibitionist if I said for myself and my children that, um, that, you know, you, you can't do this. And so we're, we're struggling to figure out what's the balance. I deleted the Gmail app off my phone so that I was forced to sit down at the computer and get my email that way in the yeah. same way that I say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm only ever going to have a, a, a six pack of beer in the fridge so that I'm not tempted to, to go past that in any single evening. And, you know, six beers in a night is, is definitely probably not a, not a good idea. Um, anyway. Um, so, so I think, um, the, the, so you're right. The, the, the way of, of learning and teaching these things in the future is in a way being, being, you know, working concurrently with the technology and also just with the, 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 a, a pragmatic way, the, the facts of life. iPhones are a fact of life. Zoom is now a fact of life. What we're, you and I are doing right now is a fact of life. And, and, and we, we are only fools to turn away from it and to assume that we can go back to reading a book, you know, you know and, and, and hoping that all the wisdom falls upon us and that, and that, and it will everyone else. I would say this lastly, I'm a, I'm a huge lover of books and that, that, um, it is a really important way to, to, to get information, but I don't for a second think that most people will receive it that way. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. You, one of the first quotes you wrote in this, cause I, I, I've really studied this just so you know, I didn't read it. I've really studied it. Um, and uh, cause it was, I was using it a lot for the book that I was writing at the time. And um, you know, one of the first things you did in here was you, um, you quoted Edgar Allan Poe and then you quoted Shakespeare as well. And one of Shakespeare's most famous quotes, I think is so pertinent now is it's the best of, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, you know? And I think, you know, we're not necessarily going down a political view here, but there are conservatives and there are progressives, but mm there's always a bad and good 
thing to anything that changes, you know, and to your point, well, sure, you know, people aren't reading as much um, because of these time constraints, but they're listening a hell of a lot more. People love audiobooks and they're, and for myself, I, I mow the lawns audiobook. I'm doing the dishes audiobook. I feel like I'm, I need to do more, you know, interaction with my partner, but we can use these. It's, it's, they are tools and, and it, I suppose the, the marketing strategy is how do we use these tools for good? Um, as opposed to just getting drowned in the in the in the bad. Yeah, and I think the, one of the first places to come to, and that, you know, um, a lot of people um, watching this might struggle with this notion. But our first place to come to is actually really questioning um, what good and bad is yep. for them. So, so let's take Trump for example. It is so easy just to go. He's bad, especially yeah. for, for a thinking person. Let's leave politics out of it. For a thinking person, you just look at him and you go, he's bad. And, that, and, and, and I think Shakespeare, you know, um, you know had that no notion nailed when he said that it's, you know, this is obviously not in thy and thou words, but, <laughs> you, know, you know, there's no such thing as good and bad. It's our mind that makes it so. To see how Shakespearean that was. I I dropped that. Very so Shakespearean. That was, yeah, yeah. Um, dude, said Shakespeare. There are bad things and there are good things. Only if your mind says so, man. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, and and I think and I think he no, but he, seriously, he did he did nail that point mm. that we are the perceivers of good and bad. And so the mm. first point before we start discussing what good and bad is is we need to wake up to the idea that it, 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 you know, our mind, you know, decides that. And then we need to say, well, actually, fundamentally, there are many things that most of us agree on that, that are, that are bad and there are laws. Um, and when we, when we study criminology, we understand that, um, that laws evolve, but some of those laws that came from scriptures and so on thousands of years ago actually made a lot of sense. Thou shall not kill. You know, most people will agree on that. And when we talk about drug law reform, it's a really interesting one because actually fundamentally when you get into it, you find that most people, uh, most Australians agree that, that um, certain drugs should not be illegal. Mm. Um, but if you ask most Australians, what about assault? You know, then absolutely most Australians will say no assault. You know, you would never decriminalize assault. Mm. Mm. Um, and so, 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 so while we, while good and bad is something that, is a is absolutely a perception there are also some 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 very kind of common sense and common thread ideas around what good and bad is um and then you then you can kind of say well someone like trump might not be you know truly bad but you know in to many of our minds way of thinking he has done many bad things um, and, um, and, and I think that that's where we start to look at it. So, so we, in our work, especially working with kids who are, you know, quite often very heavily involved in crime outside of their drug use, um, you know, it would be so easy for most people, most, you know, people in society to say that they are bad mm -hmm. because simply because of that. But no, we say mm -hmm. actually fundamentally they have made some, some bad mistakes along the way, but they are they are not bad. They are not inherently bad. Yes. So let's start at this point. Now, why am I talking about good and bad? Why am I spending time doing this? Because, because drugs and addiction are so deeply steeped in this sense of good and bad that, that fundamentally the way that this has been marketed to us, and we come back to this notion of marketing, the way it has been marketed to us since the war on drugs is that anyone, so drugs are bad, which South Park, you know, kind of eloquently nailed, <laughs> you know, and, and therefore a human who uses drugs, uh, if they are not bad, they have made a bad choice. And, and, you know, and I think this is where we start to kind of like, all right, let's, let's peel this away. Okay. So, so if I believe that um, if I assault you, then that is a bad act. Do you agree? I agree. Agree. Okay. Um, I, um, 
I just went and um, uh, injected heroin um, before this interview. Is that is that a bad act? Yes. Okay. Why? Uh, okay. I'll. I, I don't. I don't. I think that the. Um, I didn't want to ruin the play there, <laughs> but I think no, the no, act no. itself um, is potentially unhealthy. Um, I think that the person doing it might be doing it for some um, very adequate reason to self-medicate. So, so, so I would say um, that I disagree with you okay. there, that I don't think that the injecting um, of the drug is, is bad or good. I think it's harmful. And I think that okay. it, because, because it, because it's harmful, um, uh, well, you know what? I would even say that there would be people who disagree with me right now. They, they, we, we're creating a spectrum here because yeah. it's like, right, bad, I'm saying harmful. So it has an element of bad. I'm leaning towards bad than, than good. And then there's someone over here saying, actually, it's not bad at all because a doctor true, very actually true. Help, helped that person inject it and there was no harm to the person. And we can go yes. all the way down there yes. and that's just not going to help us today. What we're trying to find out though is that we both agree and we know that most Australians will agree that assaulting someone is just bad. And, you know, very few people, you know, in Australia will say that hitting someone is, is, is good. And, and, and so that, therefore that law is really important. Um, but this, this, this point here has already been questioned by our law. And that's why in, in, in New South Wales law and now in Victorian law as well, we have an Island, of law, which says that heroin use is prohibited and is against the law, unless in this, in this room, it occurs in this room. If it occurs in this room, it's not illegal. Mm. And the point of that is to help that person. So they don't say there's nowhere in the law that says this is good or, or, or this is bad that those things are suggested, but it, it is important for us to uncover what is good and bad to our way of thinking. And it's really good for you as it was for me when I started writing this book. So I had a very similar view uh, to you when I started writing this book that there was no two ways about it. Injecting heroin was if I got right down to the, to the, the bottom of it, her, injecting heroin was a bad thing. But I came away from writing that book going, you know what? I, I, I stopped thinking that I can see that for that particular person, the, the chapter you, you mentioned it before the interview that heroin saved my life, mm. you know, for that doctor and lawyer, he's a, he's a, so for those who don't know, there's a chapter in, in, in the book addicted called heroin saved my life. And it's about a, 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 a psychiatrist. He's a doctor and a lawyer who loses his wife. She commits suicide. And he, he ends up using heroin for many, many, many years um, before he, he um he becomes a doctor again um and the the notion or the this the simplistic way of talking about that and it changed my mind was that that if he hadn't have had heroin he he absolutely would have gone and committed suicide yeah and for many people her heroin is heroin is an embrace for many people heroin is not a so when i grew uh, the way i grew up seeing heroin and, and and certainly the way i see it today i have to say my my uh, bias is that 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 I just can't see heroin as anything other than 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 a dirty drug. I now also see that some people see it as something that they can use and they can live with. They they're not always lining up at the at the M sick to to get assistance to to help it. There that they can they live in other ways with it. But largely in society, it's really difficult for us to see it like that. We see exactly as you see it, which is that heroin use. And the, and the act itself is just bad. Now, certainly we can, we can slice all these things up and say that sharing a needle and sharing a dirty needle at that <clears throat> absolutely spreads disease and doesn't just harm the drug user. It harms the community, you know, the spread of HIV and, and, and hepatitis and so on. And so there, there, there are absolutely just no two ways about it, bad aspects of that injecting under certain conditions, the dirty needle and so on, and where it's injected and who it's, who's, who it's used by and so on. Absolutely. 
there's no two ways about it. I think it's really hard to argue that 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 sharing a dirty needle is just bad. There's no goodness in that. Um, um, but it, but but th- then we say, well, this is the purpose of a of a centre like a like an MSIC and so on. Um, an MSIC being um, sorry, I'm, I'm using jargon and acronyms: medically supervised injecting centre. Yep. Yep. Um, so so that's why. I'm, a medically supervised injecting center where for where that injection is supervised. Um, now it doesn't transform this into a good act, certainly in many eyes, but it does reduce the harm, not only to the person, but also to the community. And very quickly, some stats on, on medically supervised injecting centers, um, over a hundred of them uh, around the world. Now, um, the most recent one, I believe was just a few weeks ago in Victoria, Australia's third, um, and, and the first one in the English speaking um, world was King's Cross. Um, mm. And so these are very, these are very important parts of, 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 uh, of the drug and alcohol landscape because, um, you know, there's never been a fatal overdose in, in, in any of these centers around the world. Um, so they've saved every life that was, was on the edge of, mm. of dying because of an overdose. But they also reduce the spread of, of disease, like I mentioned, HIV and, and hepatitis. So they're important for all of us, even though we, we, the way it's sold sometimes to us in the media is, is you know, it's about, um, it's just about the person. But let's travel back here. So, so we go back to your point, you know, there's, there's, there's good and there's bad. Um, it's how we think about, it's how we think about uh, drugs and it's how we think about addiction. I took us off course. So we've nailed the first point, good and bad, as Shakespeare said, is completely made up in our minds. And there's going to be some people who just disagree with me and I can't do anything about that. There's going to be some people who said, God invented good and bad. There's nothing I can do about it. Fine. All right. You, you, let's just agree to disagree. Yes. I mean, I, I, what, what I, what I meant was, um, cause I actually agree with everything you said. Um, you know, I've, I've had addiction in my family and, um, when, when looking at, and I'm, you know, just to unpack where I was coming from, um, looking at the overall result, this is me being unable to take off my professional hat, the overall result Mm. being um, having that sense of um, positive emotion within yourself, you know, having recovered from whatever you were needing heroin for and being able to be fully autonomous, being the overall result. Um, Heroin use, not in itself, because it's, it's like, like in the chapter you wrote, mate, like it's just, it's so important for, for what people need, you know, just oxytocin levels up. So it's just like a, like a, a mother's hug, you know? So yes, I, um, yes. I really agree um, with your point. My, my goal just as a counselor, you know, and sometimes it's, it's, it's hard just with every, everyone though, though would be that people can um, find whatever they were using heroin within themselves, you know? Yes, yes, yes. No, I think that, I think that's right. And interestingly, um, a friend of mine, um used heroin for um over a decade not for their mother's hug but for the father's hug oh, wow. because they didn't get they didn't get that um love from their father mm. <clears throat> um so so heroin does heroin does act like that um for, for some people and and it is it's hard for us to you know even I grew up in this. I, I understood that. I still hold these biases. I still hold these things. As I said, I held them going into the book. When I was going into the book to write it, I was like, you know, just there's just never a good time to use heroin. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and knowing that, that, you know, there are some people who are just going to say, well, that's just wrong. Heroin's bad and so on. I, and, and again, the, the, the fact that I don't have any control over that is really difficult but this speaks to a certain another level which is that that we're still developing our sense of of um of our own humanity Mm. drugs the drug debate allows us and and the, the debate around addiction allows us to explore these parts of ourselves so you and i just just did it then in a very brief moment around that notion of injecting heroin good and bad you know, you had to kind of quickly go in and, and double check and, and you, you very openly and honestly just went like bad and, and express that. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I feel that too. Let, let's dig a little deeper. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Drugs, drugs allows us to kind of go, right. 
am I seeing this the right way? Do I need another perspective? And I guess that's why we have a question mark on the, at the front of the book addicted because we were asking that question of ourselves. Um, What is it? How does it work? And we get to the end of the book and we don't come to any, any final answers. And, and while I say, you know, yes, short little, you know, YouTube videos that just kind of repeat is really important. Yeah. You know, but the, the reality is, is this is an, <clears throat> this is an evolving, like, like humans, we're evolving our understanding and we're doing that. So, mm. so I think another part for me, quite separate to all of this is mm-hmm. I have a deep, a deep interest in adult development mm-hmm. and, um, and I work, uh, well, I should say I, I, um, currently working on an idea with a with a friend of mine who's a psychologist at, at harvard um oh. dr susan cook Reuter, and all of her work is in human development and 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 the integration of of the psyche and i really do more and more start to see that this is a this is a um not only important for humans for young people um and for for, for society but it is a way um, it, it would be wrong of me to say it's the antithesis of a problematic addiction. Um, and so therefore I'll say that to the way I'm currently thinking of, sure. of, of self-knowledge and, um, and, and human development and, and, and that, that self growth and, um, and adult development is, 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 is the opposite of, a problematic addiction and that's wrong because it's not final but that's that's the question that i'm asking at the moment um i believe it is i wonder if it is it's a hypothesis <laughs> yeah but I, it, you know absolutely it's it's not a it's not a it would be it, it would it would be wrong of me absolutely wrong and unforgivable if i said that's the end of that thought it's that's that's where i'm exploring at the moment well i think um just to preface that sort of thing like one of the reasons why this book is so good is because there's no bias in it. Like you yourself asked the question, you know, what does addiction essentially entail? And you took the reader on that journey with you as you were finding things out. And I think um, that's actually something that I really try to do with my own writing is that my contents page is basically just micro questions Um, that I'll need to answer to solve the major question that I'm asking. That's why I think I really liked it so much because there was no, there was no sense of, Oh, I really should agree with Matt here. You know, it's just like, Hey, does, is this a part of it? Is this a part of it? You know? Mm. Um, So I really have to thank you for that. Um, And um, I think that's um, really important when, when, whenever we're writing, um, you know, or for, for good, for good readers and just people that are seekers of the truth, I suppose. But to your um, point about what is, what makes a, a fully integrated adult um, mm. certainly feels like for me that we're born in this world is just <clears throat> innocence and ignorance and potential because we haven't really started to walk down a path at all. And, you know, then we're, um, we're, socialized and disciplined and you know we're starting to take on other people's perspectives and sometimes that's really important because it's um you know these are social pressures and ways to get along with people thou shalt not kill is obviously one of them (laughs) um and -hmm. then we move through adolescence and then we just become one of the group but then such an important part of adulthood is kind of reclaiming our own sense of childlike wonder and awe and our individuality Mm -hmm. and a lot of that you know, returning to who we were prior to um, conforming is, is really painful and, and, and takes people through this, this, this massive existential confusion. And I think yes. the more we delay that, you know, fall, um, the fall from Adam and Eve as it was in the Bible, um, the more we delay that, the more we start to see, you know, midlife crises of people that go out and buy the cars yeah. and things because they attach themselves to the ego is kind of like, I I have to still be this person, you know? Mm, mm. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. I think this is where we're at. This is the, this is the excite. This is where I get really excited in in this, in this work because it is very strength based. It is saying, all right, well, what do we do now? You know, we've got COVID and all these things happening and what's our response. What's our response to that as humans. So you mentioned a, a way of how we, how we grow up and this is studied by, 
um, Dr. Cook Reuter and um, and her colleagues uh, Ken Wilbur and 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 others at Harvard and, and and the other institutions over there in the U.S. When they looked at adult development, you can go and look at a lot of their work online, and yeah, um, <clears throat> they've they've written books on it. But the that the way they talk about it is they've they've studied these different these different stages of of development, um, and and um, what's really interesting is when you when you look at it. Um, you know, we all start in this place of of uh, opportunism. It, it's it's the idea that um, um, I need milk. I scream, you know, as a baby, and, yeah. and I get what I want. And um, if that isn't really developed later on, and I don't find other needs past that, I end up being a teenager who is who, who might like I'm using a really extreme example, but who's abused. And so therefore goes out to get what he or she needs by holding people up with a knife in the back alley. Yeah. Uh, that's, yes. yeah, that's it's, 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 it's me versus the world. Yeah. So that, that, that's what they, you know, Suzanne and others refer to as the opportunist mindset, you know, sure. but, but, you know, most of us actually move past that. We get into school and then, then we're, we're run by the rules of the group. Um, um, you know, <clears throat> Um, Jared says that, um, Brad is, is an idiot and, um, therefore we all have to hate, um, Brad and, 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 and if I don't, then I risk getting kicked out of that group and that's really bad. So, so, so there are a lot of humans that's, that's the stage of diplomacy, what they refer to as the diploma, the the diplomat. And there's a lot of people who stay, um, Either stuck or, or stay stay in that stay in that state, you know. It's the it's the group think, it's that mentality, it's doing yeah, what the group think. says, you know. Do do what do what Facebook tells me to do, like, dislike, you know, stars, <laughs> yeah. all that all that all that business. So it's so so a lot of humans um find themselves there as as a stage. But mm-hmm. the next stage after that um is the is the stage where hold on, I get to look back at that that group. And I go, uh, actually, you know what? I disagree with them. Mm. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm an individual. I'm, I'm myself. I've got my own views. And uh, yeah, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to develop these views. I'm going to write books on it about you know, drugs and alcohol. I'm going to say this. And, I'm, gonna, and I'm, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an expert now. <laughs> and now I'm in the phase of, of expertise. And I own this. And, I, and, you know, and you say this is good. And I say, well, no, that's bad. And I say, that's bad. And you say, that's good. And we fight about that. And, and the more that happens, the more my ego develops a set, this really nice, strong sense of self. And so we actually find um, many humans in that, in that, uh, in that sample um, and, and, and stay there because, because, because that's a, that's a, a place of a, a great deep sense of safety. You know it, I know it. We, 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 when we disagree, um, that, that gives us a real sense of self because we don't want to go back to, to, to the gang, do we? I mean, that, that was hard, man. That was those, those rules, that, that conformity and that, you yeah. know, that was really hard to, to hold. <laughs> and so, so we stay, we stay in this expertise. So we find that many, many, many humans actually many stay here. Um, and, and don't, can you not give me feedback on the book, by the way, because I just, I just, oh. you know, to, to be honest, I just, I think I might just, I might, might hurt this sense of, of self. And I don't know if I, I don't know if I can take that. Yeah. But one day I wake up, one day I wake up and I go, actually, you know what I'm, I think I'm ready to hear a bit more about that. And I, and I open myself up and I go, maybe that he, he's actually criticizing this, this chapter, not because he's trying to hurt me. But because it, there really is something where we're we're sharing, we're in a space of feedback, and I can grow mm. from this. And then I might actually be something for this sense of self to grow from that. And so I move into a, a phase of what these um, these doctors and researchers call the the achiever. And now now I go and say, actually, I'm I'm a bit more open to feedback now. I'm I'm not. As I'm still, I still, there's a certain amount of rigidity, but I'm not as rigid as I was. You know, I've got a guy who loves calling me and, and telling me about, um, about, uh, you know, um, 
what he what he thinks you know is right and wrong he's 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 a lot older than me i've got a lot of friends in their 60s and 70s and uh but but this particular this particular um one loves calling me to to, to tell me what i should do do with my life you know and i right. i think he senses that he is the expert of this because he's that age and he can teach me something and this kind of stuff and you know, I, 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 he probably doesn't know a lot of my friends are in their sixties and seventies, but I actually gain a lot of insight from, from, you know, my, you know, people who are 10 years, 15 years younger than me as well. I had, I don't have a preference totally, of, of totally. age in terms of, and, and correlation of wisdom there, but he, in his sense of self loves telling me like that. And, and if I try to, to, to provide feedback there, it's like not closed doors, right? right. This, is, this is it. I, I'm, I'm this. So in that space of achiever, we're more open to that feedback and, and, and a few people get there and, and in that achieving, there is that, like, there is that notion of, oh, this car and the, and the house and the family and the, and the prestige. And there is a sense of, you know, I need the order of Australia. You know, yes. I think an AO after Matt Knox would just be perfect. I don't want to admit that 21. And when I receive it, I'll be, I'll even be a little bit, you know, surprised and be like, oh, it's just such an honor. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> me what that's unbelievable yeah. thank you so much <laughs> and that and, and and you know and 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 of course this this is this is the space of the achiever and it's a beautiful thing and we see so much wonderful things coming out of that but the interesting thing i think for us here is that going back to that good and evil is that in development yeah that that we're, we're really in that space starting to open up and starting to go maybe i'm maybe i haven't got this whole thing correct you know and i'm starting to go maybe i'm not purely good either that's that's mm. really hard so a lot of people watching this are kind of going some haven't stopped to think am i a good person um they might have a thing at the back of their mind oh actually they might have a thought that was a bad thing for me to do quickly push it away mm. you know because it it, it 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 mucks up with their sense of with their sense of self and so the space the achiever is now a place where we're slightly more open to, to that and to, to hearing those things. And then that's what uh, Dr. Cook Reuter and the others kind of call the end of the conventional world. Yes. And then there's post conventional yes. and yes. then this gets into a whole really, I don't know if we want to go there. That's a whole new adventure, but, Dude, I'm but super we can't keen to go there. Super keen to go you, there right now. You want to go there now? Let, let's do it, man. I've got nothing okay. but time. <laughs> We're, I, I, I'm in lockdown. I'm in lockdown. <laughs> so, so look, I think it's a really good thing to go and to study this. And, and I'd say that, that in terms of reading, there's lots of really interesting things to, to read there. So a very brief kind of read of this, you'd just get by typing in HBR, which is short for Harvard Business Review, and then type HBR, Dr. Suzanne, S-U-S-A-N-N-E, Cook, C O K. Yep. Dash. Yep. Greuter. G R E U T E R. And, and Greuter. that, and it'll be, okay. it'll be, I think the title is something around transformations in, in leadership and the sample I should come back to, to those who are interested in this science is, 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 is Matt just making this shit up. <laughs> no, they, 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 there's a really deep um, scientific sample around this. They studied everyone, people, the people who ran Enron, people around these businesses, consultants, people in the community. So th th this comes from thousands, a study of thousands. So um, there's a lot of really rich science behind it. So mm -hmm. here, let's, let's, let's start having some fun. This is where it's interesting sure. because this sure. is where, when we start to do this, we and going and thinking back about addiction and, and what might the opposite of a problematic, not the opposite of addiction. We haven't really got too much into that. And we should, but, remind me to come back to 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 the, the spectrum of addiction after all of this yeah. but if we just for an instance all agree that there is absolutely a problematic addiction and totally. i do think that we can agree that a problematic addiction is 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 bad in the sense that it is harmful for us and only good in the sense of like that chapter gives us a space to keep us alive whilst we're trying to get those basic survival things going before we start dealing with the trauma and those other things. Um, but, but absolutely a, a problematic addiction, whether it's ice or heroin or, or, or porn or, or an iPhone is problematic is mm -hmm. 
in essence, bad. And the opposite of that might be this sense of self-discovery where it does hurt. It does help to, as I said, to go into those spaces of opening up to feedback into how I could be a better person. Have I got uh, an element of, of, of bad in me? What is good and bad? Mm. This, this, this might be the opposite of, of, of that. Mm. And so the end of the conventional world is when the person who has achieved these things in their life, achieved them, they, they kind of go, it's almost as if they're saying, is that it? Yeah. My grandfather describes it in one of his books as he's, he's this really religious young man and he's achieved all these amazing things. And he's got like prime ministers and leaders, of the community and everyone there. And, 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 and he's, and he, he really says he was like, he describes it as, and he didn't know how to, he didn't know what he was going through or anything. I, I look back on his work and I see what was happening. He's on the, he, he describes it as holding onto the edge of a building and saying, and calling out to God for help. Mm. And God walks over to the edge of the building and stands on his fingertips. Wow. And, and, um, and he, he lets go. <clears throat> now, this is a metaphor. Of course, it's, it's a, it's, obviously not literal because he would have no, he met God and he was, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He met God. God was like, you know, um, he was a legend. Um, he was a legend. Exactly. Uh, he was a she. He was a she. Go. Exactly. Um, he was a she. <laughs> he was, she was, she was a legend. She um, was sick. <laughs> so, so, so he, he lets go and he starts discovering all of these other, other, other parts. He starts exploring, um, you know, in himself, what is there just a Christian God? Mm. Was Jesus, was Jesus a God or was he just a man? He starts writing these things. He starts opening up, you know, maybe I should hold um, gay marriage celebrations at the wayside too in the seventies. And he starts doing that. Um, and he's accused of heresy, by the way, of church for all of these different things, questioning God's uh, questioning Jesus, um, godliness and and um, whether he was a god and um allowing these celebrations and naming children in the in in the family of humanity bringing them into the family of humanity as opposed to just you know the, a christian um uh, uh a baptism um wow. Wow. <clears throat> so so this is what they call the realm of the either the, the individualist or the pluralist and a simplistic way would be to think of it as the individualist goes on the, the inner journey to the really journey. kind of figure out the hero's journey, you know, and, 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 uh, and for those who don't know what you're referring to, Joseph Campbell, hero's journey, go and look it up. Lots of short five minute little cartoon videos that can tell don't you have to read the book. <laughs> you don't have to read the book hero with a thousand faces. I've never read the book to be fair. It's a good um, book. I believe. My wife has. She loves it. Okay. She says, very good. And I love the hero's journey. Anyway, we're going. You, you're doing it to me. You, you're totally pushing me off the track. I know what I'm you're so, trying to do. I'm sorry. And, and I've, I've got attention deficit disorder. Don't do it. Yeah. All right. So, so, so we come back to this place. We, we look, we, we're going on the, yeah, the hero's journey. We're going, we're, we're going down to, to, to find the dragon. What's going on in here? And so, again, meditation, all those things serve as that. A, a conduit into that into that realm and the pluralist kind of in a way does the opposite where they go out into the world to discover what the world is in the community and you know look, look sees that that oneness that you hear some people you know refer to and we know people like this i mean not not the not the the faux hippie who who says you know yeah i'm all about the this and about that and about yes. that you know but 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 really the person who who you know when you disagree with them um they're not they're not confronted by that they accept that your point of view they they actually don't just accept it they cherish that point of mm. view and the, the 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 diplomat the the sorry not the diplomat the the individualist and the pluralist um actually in, in this space, past the conventional world, now they're past this, and they've, they've let go, they're, they're in here, <clears throat> they are, they're open, 
to all of those ideas. They, they're open to all of the different things. And, in, and my grandfather became open to not just Christianity, Buddhism, mm-hmm. Hinduism, you know, Islam, and, and agnosticism and atheism. And so he, 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 he conjured up that notion of the family humanity when he said, mm-hmm. I'm a Protestant, but I'm also a Catholic. I'm a Jew, but I'm also a Muslim. I'm a Hindu, but I'm also a Sikh. I'm an agnostic, but I'm also an atheist because first and foremost, I'm a human being wow. and no one in this world is a stranger to me. And that's, that's that insight. And it's, a, and it's a beautiful one where we kind of start to see, to see all of those things. We, we really enjoy others' ideas. And so that's a, that's a really beautiful stage of development and and um and people there you know find that they're suzanne talks about it as intoxicated with with in with life <laughs> yeah you know it's exciting because everything now the journey kind of goes in all these different places and so um my wife spent <clears throat> um a lot of time living in africa and nepal and those things and really kind of went on that that um that outward journey to, to do things like that so so um so there's that and um then we then we go into a really interesting realm after that and and these numbers start to shrink so the sample starts to shrink inside and we see less and less people kind of there and suzanne and her work they just they find less and less people you know smaller percentage kind of get into these these spaces although my very um, uninformed, naive hypothesis is that 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 uh, the next generation will 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 start to see more and more people grow into these different phases. It has to be; it's evolution. They're going to be growing there, and younger people will be understanding the, the, these parts. Um, but the place we come after that 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 exact thing that I just said, Ted's quote of "I'm a human being, and no one in the world." Is, is a stranger to me. Um, that, that, that is actually saying, I understand everyone. I mean, I understand everyone. And, and there is absolutely an element of ego in that. There really is a sense of like, I, I know this. It's almost like a reflection back to that, back to that expert of like holding there. So, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's yes. a different form of it. Yeah, this and is it's ego inflation it. at its finest. Yeah, spiritual yeah. ego and, and, inflation. Yeah, and we, and and we start to recognise that maybe we're not as perfect or good as we as we first start to think, and this is where this is where we start to sense that there is a there are darker aspects of ourselves, and this is where we start to go, and we we start to understand what what many psychologists, I think it was Jung who first talked about the shadow. And this is where we start to look at this. And you have a lot of modern day work, uh, literature. Brené Brown loves talking about the shadow. And, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, keep our shadows in front so that, you know, they never um, yeah. catch us from behind and so on. And, and, um, and the shadow, as we start to appreciate that maybe we're not this just like one, you know, just a good person we have these different sides, we start to awaken uh, and that aspect and we start to, to ask it questions and start to have a dialogue with that. Um, and this is a space um, where we, we, we come into a place beyond pluralism and, and, um, and, and I don't want to kind of go, I don't want to, I would, I don't want to talk about it too much from here, but that's when it gets very interesting. <laughs> yeah <laughs> because because suddenly we're not we're no longer just purely good or bad people and people in the world aren't just good and bad and we start having to deal with those parts of ourselves you know and 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 I think that you know you know it it's it, it is really it is really difficult especially if you're you know like yourself you know you're 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 a therapist um and and your job is about helping people yeah and and it's all about that well what could be bad about that what what are the what are the negative aspects of that 
it's far easier just to say, let's not go there. And so therefore we come back to addiction because then when we do start to delve deeper that. into that, we, we go, uh, I'm just going to turn away from that from a second. I, I didn't actually notice that part of, part of myself. I'm just going to go over here. And of course, yeah. what, we, what we end up doing is finding you know, our phones and, and the things there. You know, we start to, to, to discover all of those different um, aspects of ourselves. And of course, the internet does that, you know, um, and, 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 and drugs do that and so on. And, and you know, and so, um, you know, and, and, and the easiest thing to think of here, of course, is, is porn, because porn is that, that place of, of, of um, it's very, it's very, you know, personal to us. And it's, it's, it's kind of there. Um, and, and again, like, absolutely has, you know, just, it's, it's so, it's even harder than, than drugs to, to untangle, you know, us spending time trying to untangle the, you know, the, the, the difficulties around that. And we separating, you know, sex and, and separating um, phones and all of those things, you know, a real concern, I think going forward for parents is, is pornography. And mm. it's hard because, because it's something that's always been there for us, you know, but for me as a kid, it was really just that, that magazine. And now it's just like everything and it's there. And so, um, you know, we, we, we start to, to, to understand addiction in all of these different forms. And, and of course, as we become more self-aware and we, we, we do start moving into these different phases, then we, we, we are aware of that stuff, but it, it doesn't make it easier. Yeah. It doesn't make it like, Oh yeah, suddenly I'm just like, I'm just cool with the fact that, um, I, um, you know, go and use this particular drug or I go up, you know, and, and search these things on the internet. Um, that's, that's all of us. And, and we are learning as we develop how to deal with this, this. So let's come back mm -hmm. to this part mm -hmm. of, of addiction. So, so I've described a lot of things I've described in terms of addiction has been problematic addictions, whether it is, um, a problematic addiction to porn, whether it's a problematic addiction to cannabis, whether it's a problematic addiction to, to, to heroin or, or to a phone. Um, you know, these are, we say these are problematic because they are hurting the person and they're, they're doing more harm than they are helping the person. Sure. And that, that's what a problematic addiction is. And I don't, I purposefully don't use words like, functional and dysfunctional because um i think that has more to do with society's perspective of what a what a person you know is if they're useful or not you know a functional person is someone who just gets up and goes to work and so they might be functional um from the point of view of the government because they're kind of working or they might be dysfunctional mm -hmm. because they're on centrelink and they're not contributing that's that's not how i see it um you know lives are all, all lives are important and, and and not because of what they provide back to society just because life mm. is, is is important so so we i don't talk about that i talk about problematic um addiction so that so we i think we're clear right before i move mm -hmm. on to white addiction are we clear on what what you what i think problematic addiction is totally so at least from cool. my perspective i think the listeners cool. are uh yeah, we we always love talking about addiction. So hopefully, <laughs> so so um, so then we look at um, um, addiction more broadly. Is addiction always problematic? And I think the most surprising thing that we found in the book was no. Mm. And it comes back to Shakespeare's quote: um, "Dude, not everything is bad and good. It's just you who's deciding. <laughs> depending what." the day it is <laughs> pretty sure that was the quote wasn't it yeah, yeah. Um, he was good he was good he was very very modern yeah. for his time <laughs> he was he was such a good writer yeah bestseller apparently bestseller. Um, yeah so um so so we we start to we start to think well what is there such thing as a as a as a, as a positive addiction the latest research that was just <clears throat> kind of coming out and based on obviously a lot of previous research, but the research was coming out as we went to finish the book was some studies that had kind of shown that, that 
that addiction was this actually not this separate thing, but actually a part of uh, a um, a a mammalian response and part of the, the brain and was actually, uh, so it was Sha- I didn't mention this too. Not only did Shakespeare have that quote, but he, but he actually coined the term addiction. Yes. He coined the term addiction and, 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 um, and you might need to quote me back to me cause I can't remember what it was, but, but basically the way that, the way that the, I think there's a, like a whole thing I wrote on there in it, but yeah, essentially, yeah. but, but, but Shakespeare, refers to addiction as essentially as an obsession if i was going to simplify it and and this is what the slate of science was showing that <clears throat> was that you know um in the, even in the very kind of early stages of humanity we would go and, and and fall in love with someone and that would obviously have all sorts of other benefits biologically and for, for the for the race in that we would create more of ourselves um, and so that was was that 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 um, uh, falling in love with a drug like ice or heroin was that the same things were happening in the brains falling in love with a human being <clears throat> so exactly the same exactly the same patterns and and therefore therefore you could say well actually falling in love with a human being over in this case is actually is not negative at all it's really positive. And falling in love with this drug over here is actually, you know, leading to this sort of, this harm, and that's 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 negative and that's problematic. So let's look over and look at the positive stuff. And when we see that, it is that, it, you know, all these different chemicals are being released and telling us to do that. Obviously, you know, I don't want to get into it. There's a lot of kind of, and this is where a lot of more work is going into it. But mm. you know, um, dopamine, you know, releases of dopamine, and so on, are kind of encouraging us to seek a particular pathway. So mm. it's falling in love it's getting up and going to work. It's writing a book. Um, it's, it's, it's creating something, you know? So, so we, we, we find that addiction is actually the thing that we become obsessed with. And so really in a very naive point of view, we get to the end of the book saying actually addiction before we go on to say, here's a positive addiction, you know? And, 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 and I don't, I, don't, I kind of don't want to do that because I think we're still learning about that. Um, but what we can certainly say is that by the time we get to the end of this book is we say, well, it's not just good or bad. It's neutral. It just is. Addiction is. It is a part of being a human. Mm. It is the thing that gets us up to go to work. It is the thing that could drive us to have a problem with heroin. Mm. It is. It just is. And so understanding that kind of helps us to look at the different things that we do in our life and um, <clears throat> it kind of goes, all right, this, this is, you know, this is what I'm doing. So I, so I interview in the book, um, um, or, you know, uh, psychologists who talk about that notion that even the, the notion of writing a book and, and me writing a book is, is an, is an addiction. And, um, um, and, and I look at that. So, so before I get on to, the, to, to the interview here today with you, I go and delete Gmail off my phone because mm. I do recognize that I'm being drawn into this. And the latest thing that I'm, that I'm looking at is, and, and, and some people have really, have really looked for this, but, but I, I haven't seen anything that, that, that really simply um, identifies a, a pattern for people to look at and, and, and see in themselves. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think the next really interesting work is not just the study around how habits, you know, um, how habits are formed, um, how that, how those then become deep predictions, you know, but actually how that's, how that store, how that story is told. And there's, there's a good one for you, you know, mm-hmm. um, thinking about that because I think that um, obviously my you know checking my email is not uh, an addiction yet but i could sense very vaguely that it was heading into that space it had started it clearly was a habit and and a negative one but it was clearly heading into that space and so you know lots yeah. of books kind of say oh yeah habits become all sorts of things yes but how how much more do we understand about that how simply can we illustrate that and what and and then once we do know that, what are some what are some ways you know around this and, and simple solutions for people? Um, mm. And for me right now, the the best thing I can do with my phone 
is um, I, I believe, you know, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, prohibiting it, um, you know, is okay if I turn it off for the weekend. Um, but, but it never solves, it never, it never kind of solves the problem. Actually, <clears throat> some, some easy things like just forcing myself to go and get email on, on the computer. I find computers far less for me anyway, um, addictive. I'm always happy to jump off my computer. And yes. um, my, my wife had a really interesting idea around that was that quite simply, I can't carry my computer to go and get the, the cup of tea. Um, but my phone, I can take anywhere to the toilet, to the cup of tea, you know, um, down the road. And, and just because of that ease of use, it, 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 it simply is, is always there. Whereas yes. a computer, you know, is just frustratingly kind of big and clunky and, and that's good. So I kind of started using that to, to, um, to mitigate that uh, problematic addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. No, I really appreciate you um, speaking about it. You know, I can't help but um, kind of see myself um, in these things. And, you know, when you started talking about depth psychology and, and Jung and, you know, really trying to explore the total spectrum of consciousness from good to evil. Um, you know, one of the first things that came up for me um, when I was, um, cause I'm addicted to writing. I can't, I, I can't stop writing. Um, <laughs> And I was looking at, you know, why have I become a counsellor? Is it because I genuinely want to help people or am I still attached to this need for external validation from what was lacking perhaps in my childhood? And it took me a really long time to um, think about that. You know, am I trying to put myself out there to externally that? Look at me, I'm wonderful. I'm a counsellor. I'm a therapist. I can help everyone. But it's like, is that coming from a real scarce place within me, you know? And um, I love the fact that, that kind of comes back to this um, problematic addiction idea. It's like, well, you've, you know, you've, you've, you've self transcended yourself to the point of total oneness. And as Ram Dass says, you've become nobody. <laughs> yeah. You're happy yeah. for the ego to consistently regulate and you can just detach yourself from that and watch yourself change. Um, but even still, is there some bigger ego that you're just att addicted to, you know? And I think like to yeah. your point um, of, um, these little things with the phone to simplify it. It just mm. takes consistent reflection and, and, and mediation. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's it. That's it. Ram Das is great <clears throat> as well. And I've got a lot of friends uh, getting in there and, and, um, and uh, yeah, and I think that's, um, yeah, our, our Alex Wodak um, is one of my Yodas. It talks about, um, I think it was, a drug law reformer in the US, Ethan Nadelman, who who went and, and met with Ram Das and said, mm. "So, and I hope, I hope I don't want to get it wrong, but I'm paraphrasing." Essentially, he said, "How do I deal with my enemies?" And Ram Das um, responded, saying, "Love them." Mm. And um, you know, it's a it's, that remains a good one. So I, I thought of that when you said that, but mm. you know. Um, one of the most interesting things where we get to with that, you, you kind of like went on that, that, that self-exploration. Why am I doing this? And why is a really interesting one. I, you know, there are a lot of people at the moment are really interested in why and always get to the why before anything else. Yeah. You know, I think, I think, yeah. And at some, at some stage in that kind of development, we have to drop the why. Um, you know, the why is kind of like asking why is almost asking like, you know, is, is there, is there a God? Yeah. I think why is real. I think why is really good in some early, in some early stages. And then as we, as we, as we move on, you know, there's only so much kind of mud you can churn up and at some stage you just kind of get on with it. Yeah. It's more that, it's more that notion of acceptance that you and I admit freely that we, we are absolutely our egos are absolutely getting something out of the, totally. the notion of helping someone whether we're helping them or whether we just you know hope that we're uh, that, that, that we're helping them um that that we have to just have a a um a faith that that it's working and and we can test that we can test that this is why evidence is so important and i think that I think that you were talking about, you know, the best of times, the worst of times. Um, I think I just stuffed up that 
that that quote as well, didn't I? I'm taking I'm taking all of the best quotes, Shakespeare and Dickens, and uh, and I'm taking everyone, and I'm just ruining them. Um, it's my job today. That's right. Um, that's right. So, yeah. Um, so, the, one of the best parts about um, about uh, you know COVID is that is that it really is um, making us obviously, you know, question where we're at as a, as a, as a civilization, it's helping us question ourselves. It's giving us mm-hmm. time because we, because we are so bored. Um, th- those of us who choose to be courageously bored. There we go. Did you see that? I just marketed it. That's awesome. It. That's awesome. Um, those of us who find the courage to be bored and, and go on those journeys of self-discovery yeah. will find that there's a lot of whys down there and mm. at some stage need to go, okay, um, I, I need to move on. Um, but, but we will also come back to relying on science, which was, which was what I was going to say, which was at some stage you will know, someone will say to you, you have you have changed my life. You have helped me in some capacity. As an organisation, you know the the data that we that we collect on how people have you know is there has there has there been a reduction in crime since the young mm. people leave? You know, yes, we see a sixty percent reduction in crime. You know, a, a significant redu- reduction in drug use, um, significant re- you know reduction in in, in mental illness, um, and obviously you know an, an increase in in in, in mental health and. Um, and and the flourishing of lives Mm. um so yes the reality is is am i doing this because it is assisting my ego in some way absolutely um you know do i do these particular things because um you know i I want to be like my grandfather absolutely what should i do about that well you know frankly there's not a lot that you or i can do about this but we come back to our reflections on good and bad and, and addiction and we say, is what I'm doing harming someone? Is it? And, and, and if so, um, then um, I should probably stop that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but if, I'm, if what I'm doing is not harming me and it's not harming anyone else and it's actually helping people, then who cares why you became a counsellor? Mm-hmm. You, you, you are and um and and you're contributing and that's wonderful and i and i think that i think that that um it's really easy for therapists sometimes to get stuck in a, in a lot of that and i think that it, there is a time there is a time to go down to to kind of find the dragon and then once you've kind of you know been discovered what that that, that it simply exists instead of this idea of like trying to change it and morph it into what you want it to be is actually accepting it yeah. and saying that is me and now i'm going to come back up to find what i am outside of this because you are more than just the person who's doing this for a fulfillment of ego that's just the thing that makes you and i more similar mm-hmm. that aspect that that aspect isn't such a negative aspect there's more a common aspect um you know what's uncommon what's what's unique to you what are you bringing to this and 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 i think that they're the things that that we should really go and 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 and, and kind of discover more about. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm so pumped that you brought that point up because it is just so important. I think for people we, um, and especially with COVID now, people that perhaps haven't ever entertained self reflection and existential thought and stuff, and you know we're bombarded with social media of inner healing, shadow work, and who are you and the why. And um, we've almost gone to the point now where we're happy to just become chaos without any sense of routine and structure and order. And I think, um, you know, even Jung made this point as well, because he was one of the most self-reflective individuals of all time. He sat up in his attic every night for dinner and had his um, encounter with the unconscious, you know, but without that, oh, yes, I am still a human being we just, we just drown. And then, and then to your point, um, when we're, we're still not helping everyone, anyone, you know, if you're, if you're just constantly trying to slay that dragon and go why and deeper and deeper and deeper, unless you want to live a life of recluse and become a monk, like go for it, you know, Mm. as muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone, just go off and live that life. 
but um, yeah. without the, and this was my mistake, you know, I, I work primarily in the existential area, but um, my mistake was just unraveling everything because it, it all had some kind of unconscious attachment. And I, um, you know, had, I was in, I, I believe um, there was a element of psychosis with what went on there. You know, um, I wasn't very fun. <laughs> um, so having that mm. balance of like, okay, now it's going to be my meditation practice where I journal after it and have a think about who I am, what I want to do. But at the end of the day, I still love my kids and, my dogs and uh, I'm happy being this particular ego. Yeah. So I really appreciate the fact that you brought that up, Matt, because I think that's um, uh, a point that is often missed in this kind of self-development world today. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think so. At some stage we've just got to, we've just got to, yeah, get on with it. But I, but I think that, I think that, you know, there'll obviously be a lot of people who will be listening who do need to kind of begin that yeah. that journey of self discovery, and I think that, um, and I think it it is a really good good, uh, you know, kind of journey to to go on, especially if you find yourself stuck in the expert, you know, where a lot of people do, yeah. um, and and um, and and you know, um, w- w- the only thing I'd say uh, to to that person is is um, you're not alone. Um, you know, that you never lose that, that aspect of yourself. Um, it becomes, you know, stronger. Um, and then when someone disagrees with you, um, when you make a mistake, when you do something wrong in, in any sense, you know, all you're doing is becoming more human. Um, and, um, <clears throat> never let anyone write you off. And, and tell you that um, that you know something was such a bad choice and, and so on, you know, and and be open, be open to mm. to feedback and ideas, and and know that it cannot harm you. So um, mm. I really enjoyed today, and I really appreciate yeah. you um, to listening, and um, and and I, and I, and, I, and I really appreciated your stories as well. I think that um, I'm really looking forward to to more of your written work and, and you know, they're, um, hopefully we can yeah chat again. Mate. Absolutely. I love it. Um, I think, um, definitely got to get you back on the show for sure. We could go even deeper next time, depending on what we, uh, we look into. <laughs> we'll see how deep we can go. <laughs> um, Sounds Matt, good. do you have anything you want to, um, plug anything that's, that's coming up for you right now that you could tell the listeners? No, no, I just, um, obviously the books are there. If they're interested, um, addicted, um, is out there breaking the ice is out there and um, and we're developing some more online resources which should be available by Christmas so keep an eye out for those awesome awesome mate thank you so much like I said um, we won't uh, you know we, we'll definitely do it again and um, that, that it'll be brilliant thanks mate thanks for having me cool thanks mate cheers guys bye